and the communications rep out of Grand Lodge. And I like to describe my position as a relationship builder, a relationship builder who has to make sure that we're able to communicate and tell the stories of our members, not only to each other, but also to the outside world. So I, I really try to think about that every time that we write anything that comes out of our department, but also the things that are happening out there in the field. Good morning. Um, my name is Ed Sills. I'm Communications Director with the Texas AFL-CIO, the State Labor Federation here. And uh, uh, the first thing I want to say is how it, it does my heart so much good to see so many communicators here in one room in a union that, that I feel really close to. We have such a strong Texas connection uh, in this union at, at, at the international. And um, my job is basically the traditional media job. I'd say I'm the analog version of, of what we do. I started on manual typewriter. I do a lot of writing, which I'll be glad to talk about a little later. I do the media relations and try and pitch in and just about everything else. Good morning. My name is uh, Mark Maldonado. I'm the digital strategist here at the Texas AFL-CIO. I do uh, everything from their social media accounts uh, to handling uh, websites to handling our activist and email list and um, doing uh, some graphics and creative uh, for the Texas AFL CIO. So it's a digital strategist position, but kind of like what Delaine was saying, I think we see ourselves as almost digital organizers in this role, trying to get people um, to move and, and to take action at the legislature, so I'm really excited to be here. Okay, all of us pretty much have email, and our email inboxes are flooded. You know, we have political emails, fundraising emails, we have work emails, friends emails, we have ads that are coming from social media sites like Facebook and Twitter, all the things that we forgot to opt out of. Um, but it's a lot of media noise. So the question is, how do we cut through that media noise to make sure that we are understanding and hearing what labor has to say? So how do you, what tactics do you use to labor? Um, and you can each answer, how do you cut through that clutter? Well, for me, the challenge is always, how do I get in the reporter's inbox? Um, they get so many press releases. We're not the only ones sending them a press release. So you have to figure out how to make that personal connection. You have to make sure you're hitting the right reporter, um, on the subject matter, something that pertains to them. And you have to not always send a two-page press release. Um, keep it simple. Um, we talked about that yesterday. We have to make sure we keep it simple, and we have to develop those relationships. And it's not just over email. Uh, we have to find out what their interests are, just on, not on social media only, but we have to make sure that we're um, reaching them in the right area, the right interest area. I personally prefer those one page news releases. So, Ed, Ed, what do you think? How do you cut through the limit? Well, I, I think uh, what Delane says is extraordinarily important. Um, uh, early on uh, in this job, I, I thought through uh, how I wanted to communicate with uh, activists in the movement and with reporters in our state. And um, I came upon, and this was early, this was back in 1998 when this actually was cutting edge. Uh, doing a daily email that would talk about the issues on, at hand and maybe some fun stuff, you know, what we do every day. And it would go out exactly once a day on work days only. And it would go uh, only to people who wanted it. Um, I, I had read a book by uh, Seth Godin about permission marketing. And I was convinced that if you're receiving something in your email from somebody you don't know on a subject you haven't asked for, you're going to consider it garbage. And I wanted to make sure that the people who were signed up on our email list did not think that we're receiving garbage. Um, you know, the result is we, you know, we have a much higher than average open rate on those daily emails. And everything else we do in terms of setting up the information flows from from what we put in that email. Uh, everyone on our staff has access to it. It's not, you know, it's not uh, only an Ed Sills project, but, but uh, we try and make it interesting. We try and make it fun. And most important, we try and get the issues you all care about that, that, that are fundamental to the people who 
pay their dues to our unions. At what time do you send those emails out? Uh, end of the day. Uh, it, it's, it's as current as I can make it. <laughs> uh, I started out as a newspaper reporter, and I, I try and bring a new sense to it. Uh, I'm not going to tell you it's not propaganda. It is propaganda. We're not, we're not going to do the job of uh, people who disagree with us. But I, I believe very strongly in, in keeping to the facts within, within our mission. And as the digital person, uh, I love receiving Ed's emails. I thought it would be a great idea. How can we get this into a social media sort of world? And so uh, when I came on, uh, the Texas Bank of CIO, uh, the website uh, needed to be revamped. We revamped it, and I built it in a way where uh, it would be receptive to Ed's uh, daily email. And so we turn the daily email into a blog style format and it posts uh, the next morning um, on Facebook and on our website. So if you were to go right now to the Texas AFL CIO Facebook page at 7.30 in the morning right now, you can see uh, a version of Edge daily email in a blog format. So just one of the many tools that we're trying to do to kind of cut through this week as a digital person over here, we have to use every single medium that we that we have, uh, uh, whether it be Twitter, whether it be now uh, Snapchat, um, Facebook, um, even our own action network. And for me, I'm just trying to uh, maintain some authenticity to what we're doing. I think when you get an email, whether it be from the party or something, you don't you don't even look at it, you don't even open it. So how do you maintain this? authentic voice of the issue or the worker, um, that's kind of that's kind of how you have to approach things and, and people are going to open if they do feel like there's something authentic uh, taking place uh, and it's an issue that's going to affect them. Okay, Mark, let's stick with you. You know, labor makes up less than 11% um, of the population in the United States. How do you make labor matter? Can you give a real life example of something that you made work in your area where you got that word out? Um, for, uh, for us, uh, and for myself, we've been working on a raise the wage campaign here in Texas. And uh, for me, uh, Ed has his email. I've always uh, enjoyed expressing myself through graphics um, and trying to place those graphics uh, on social media, we place it into the petition, but we kind of start with the graphic to kind of express what we're trying to do, and then it kind of goes from there, uh, whether it be uh, we place it into our Action Network email, uh, and then we just try to make kind of get like a viral spin to it. So, um, Raise the Wage Texas, we, we give a, a, a microsite landing site for it, and it kind of goes back. Uh, to our website, and it gives a different dimension of just the state feds website. Uh, we have a, a, a landing place where people can go and they can read about the issues and just, uh, about the Texas wage, just how bad, how bad it is, and they can take action and get a different sense of just going to our state feds website. Ed, can you just give us an example of how you may have made labor relevant in your internet? Well, um, I'd like to go back to the beginning of, of your question. Um, the statistic in Texas is actually fewer than 5% uh, are, are union members. And if that's the only audience we're going to deal with, we're in big trouble. Um, I would say that we, we don't look at our mission as only serving that 5%. We look at our mission as serving all the working people in Texas. So I, I would say the things that we have scored the most coverage on in this session have been matters that are not union related. Uh, most of the time, the union issues are not going to fly with the media. But um, something like, we, we have, uh, I think John Patrick may have told you about SB4, the, this awful immigration bill. And we're, we're content to in, insert our message into the dialogue but let others carry it. Uh, we, we don't think that we get on television or get coverage over that issue uh, uh, other than maybe at the bottom of the story, but we can provide working people 
who have lived that issue and are, are truly afraid of the consequences of that, of that anti-immigrant bill. And that's, that's where we try to enter the picture on an issue like that. Uh, you know, we, we, we have to acknowledge that we're marketing to non-members almost primarily, and, and the story we tell to them is going to determine our future. The people who are in our movement, their hearts are in it, and, and they understand what we're doing. We don't have to persuade them, we have to persuade everyone else. Yeah, and I, and I think we, we have to make sure that we're developing relationship with influencers. And when I say influencers, instead of just talking to a reporter about a story, we need to sit down with editorial boards of all the different newspapers. I mean, the way it's set up nowadays, these are corporations that we're dealing with. You deal with one, one paper, it's usually a group of papers that are owned by the same person. So you have to talk to those influencers, sit down, get your subject matter out, and a lot of times, it's, it's eye-opening for a lot of these in, influencers, and a lot of them have a labor background, whether or not a grandfather, a grandmother, or, or a parent. They grew up in a union household, and they would love to talk about our issues, but they just don't know enough. Um, so we have to get to those influencers. Uh, one good example is we decided to open up the headquarters to Bloomberg be an ape reporter. So we, she did a tour of headquarters, and she ended up doing a story two weeks later on us being at the forefront of 3D printing technology. And those are the type of things that we have to keep doing in the future. We have to have the right attitude, because when you have the right attitude about this and love what you're doing, then you'll have a vision, a vision to keep pushing this and keep coming up with creative ideas. And that's what I love about our team, is that everybody gets creative. It's not just pushing out the emails and everything we see every day. We go a step further because we love what we're doing. How important is it to make it personal? We were talking about that this morning in a, one of our morning meetings about making it personal, using a worker. How much of a difference does that make when you're trying to attract the reporter to the story? Well, for me, a, a very personal story um, that recently was placed. Um, I'm staying in Hollywood, Maryland at, at one of our the best thing that we have going is, uh, is our W3 center. And the kitchen received a gold star recognition. And we put it out in our email, and we, of course we tweeted it out and some other things. And so we all got together and we thought about it. Like, how can we push this further? How can we give recognition to people who have been serving us to the best of their ability for so long? And so we decided to try to place this in uh, local newspapers right around that area in St. Mary's County. They picked it up, and you could see once that story hit, just the pride when they when they had people come up to them and tell them, "I saw you in the St. Mary's paper. I saw you in the County Times." And those are the little things that you do in order to keep us going, in order to keep people pushing further. And, and, and that's what we need to do more of. Whether it's whether you're in Washington building little homes, or whether you're doing a poker run in Marietta, Georgia, you know we have to get that stuff out because we do so much, and and, and that's the best part of this. Uh, yeah, we uh, just dealt with a, a bill here uh, in Texas where uh, you would have to get parental consent if you're under the age of 18 to join. A union, and we had a um, we had a worker who had uh, was in the grocery stores, and when she joined the union, uh, I think at the age of 16, and we made a video to kind of get her voice out there. But when she spoke uh, there at the Capitol, and she spoke at a committee that was very unfavorable, um, her story resonated where they didn't even want to push back with questions. It was such a powerful story. And those are the sort of stories that that people want to hear. They don't want to hear all the legalities around that sort of issue. They wanted to hear this 16-year-old who had joined the union because it was important to her to better herself there uh, at her job. So you put a face on the issue. I, absolutely. Yeah.
uh, along similar lines, uh, we we had a bill and still have a bill. Thank God, it's still out there. We're still killing it. That that uh, would take away the right of state and local public employees to have uh, their union dues deducted from their paychecks. Uh, you can deduct uh, almost anything else, ranging from the ACLU to focus on the family, but they were going specifically after most of the public sector unions. And two years ago, that bill was greased to become law. It, it had the governor's support, lieutenant governor. It, it was on a rocket ship. And late in the session, there was a hearing in uh, a House committee that was called uh, with less than 24 hours notice at 8 a.m. It was, it was supposed to be a pro forma thing. Uh, we were able to put the word out and get 200 union activists to show up to oppose that bill. One of them, uh, a correctional officer, drove in a couple of hundred miles from East Texas to uh, testify. And she got up there and she said, you know, I, I, work, I work in the prison system. Uh, it's a dangerous job. We never know, you know when we might get attacked. I work a lot of overtime, early in the morning to late at night. And this bill is telling me that I'm going to have to take time out of my life to deal with something that I shouldn't have to deal with. I'm, I'm serving the state. I, I put my heart into it. I try, and, I try and do right by the people. And this bill is, is going to tell me that my choice of which organization to support is the wrong one. It was an incredibly powerful testimony. At the end of the hearing, that chair said, there are problems with this bill, and I think we're going to hold it that last session, and uh, it set the, that testimony set the stage for interim work that put us in a much better position, even, even though the bill was even more greased this session. It, it was really, I, I think back to that witness and a couple of others that joined her as being the turning point and how we were able to stop a bill that is passed in a lot of other states. Uh, so I, I, I put all my faith in getting the best possible spokesperson who's, who's well prepared and stays on message, but who, who delivers an authentic labor message. So we're hearing cutting through the noise, you know, keys to that are creating empathy, making it personal, you know, finding a personal story can really be noticeable. Um, closing thoughts before we open it up to questions, because we'd like to leave a few minutes for you to ask questions. I would say we have to think of communicating like we're in the sales business. We have to make sure that people understand what we do, but we have to have the right attitude, and we have to make sure we're delivering the best customer service that's out there. I always have the mind frame of thinking, what would a Costco manager do um, if an issue came on your table, on that table? And they always provide some of the best services, but the three words that always make a big difference in any type of relationship that you have, whether you're dealing with the media, whether you're dealing with members, dealing with whoever, you have to say please and thank you. That's very important in what we do. And I really want to emphasize that we have to make sure that we have <coughs> the best attitude about what we do, we love what we do. Um, and it helps us go forward. But one way I, I try to uh, cut through clutter um, is to uh, maintain a running dialogue with the reporters that we want to deal with. And when I, I define reporters we want to deal with as reporters who have demonstrated that they're, they're able to process our issues. Sometimes our issues are kind of complex and that they're, they're willing to you know, write about us now and then if, if they feel we, we make the bar for making news. And, um, I, I count part of that relationship as sometimes talking to them and giving them tips on things that may not even have anything to do with uh, what, our, what our message is. If I run into a piece of news that I think they'll be interested in, I'll just send it to them. More often than not, they're really glad to get it. Uh, I think reporters love that. I, I mean, it, it, it beats.